Hello there. Now, in this video, I'd like to go into a bit more depth, a bit more detail about the first of those four characteristics of lighting, and that's direction. Initially, just sort of an idea about what I mean when I refer to direction, but then we're going to dig quite a bit deeper into something called inverse square law, which might sound a trifle intimidating, but is a really, really key principle for you to get your head around. Enjoy. So now we'll go through each of those four facets of light in a bit more depth. First one I'd like to talk about is direction. Now, to be more accurate, direction ought to really be defined as where the light is coming from, because it also includes distance. But for simplicity, we'll just stick with direction and we'll understand that how far away the light is also has an effect. Now, in the simplest way possible, the question is, is the light coming from where you want it to, to create the effect you're after? Obviously, light you know, if you only have one source of light, it can only come from one direction. Using this very powerful little torch and this little ramekin dish as an example, you can see the obvious. I mean, we, we really are talking about the basic, simplest things going here, but you've got to get your head around it and you've got to understand that even though it's so obvious you take it for granted, you've got to factor it into what you're shooting. When we point a light at a, an object like this, as you can see, we have an area of highlight that is bright, which is the area of the object that is facing the light. We then have an area that is uh, that I always think of as the transition, but some people call the core, which is where you move from the highlight through into the darker area. And then you have a cast shadow. Uh, now obviously the location of these elements will vary depending on where you move the light around. Okay, if the light is round to the side, the shadow will move around. If the light is from the top, then the shadow will almost diminish around the object. If the light is in the same line as the camera axis, then the shadow will be behind the object and the object will appear very flat. And if we reverse that, of course, the shadow will come towards the camera and the highlight will be harder for us to see. What all of this does is it creates the illusion in a two-dimensional thing, which is the photograph, of an object having three dimensions. And of course, exactly how you want this to look is going to be varying from photograph to photograph. But you must appreciate that with one light, like this, it's going to have highlight, transition, and shadow. You can't get away from that. You simply need to manipulate either the light, or move the object, or possibly even move both of them, to create the effect you're after. Sticking with very, very simple principles, something else you need to understand is that, of course, if you add another light, or several lights, you will then have another set of highlight, transition, and shadow. And those might be conflicting with each other. Okay, your answer to, let us say, the situation of having a light like this on this with a highlight there and lots of shadow there might be, oh great, I'll just put a light into this shadow here. Well, you'll probably lift lots of this shadow, but you'll create another shadow around here and you know, the results might not be what you're looking for. So bear in mind, as is always the case in photography, the more elements you add to it, the more you complicate things. That's effectively all you need to know about direction. Um, it's very nuanced, it can get very, very complex because as with all these things, all four features work together, you, you can't escape any of them, so it might be that as you try and alter the quality that has some effect on the, on the direction and then the distance. But really that's all there is to it. Think of a single light source like this, and think of it falling on the subject you want to photograph, and are they interacting in the right way? Is this light coming from the direction you want to create the image you're after? If not, can you move this light, or can you move the subject, or can you possibly move both of them? Okay, so I said that direction should be called, really, where the light is coming from, and that it also incorporates distance. How far away the light is from your subject. Now, why this matters is hopefully fairly too easy, easy to understand, and that is that the further away a light is, the more of the light is scattered, and therefore the less of it will actually reach your subject. Okay, so you've got basically a quantity issue. Like I said, there's, don't forget, the four facets. You've got direction, quality, quantity, and color. So the distance a light is from your subject will affect the amount of it that gets to it. Now, where this applies most prominently is in something called inverse square law. Uh, what a terrifying sounding thing. That sounds like the sort of thing you used to have to do at school. This is not what you're here to study. Oh my God, please don't talk to us about physics. 
I'm afraid it is a basic thing of physics. Uh, however, what's great about it, like most of the basic underlying laws of photography, just like exposure and the rest, is that it's a basic rule and you can't break it. Okay, so of course once you understand it, you, you can't escape it, but you can work around it and you can use it to your advantage. Now, inverse square law, in practice, looks like this. What you have here is a perfect point source of light, and as the light extends away from that source, as the, as the beams of light travel towards your, your subject in the direction you want them to go, as you double the distance from the light, you quarter the amount of light there is. Now straight away that sounds slightly counterintuitive because on the surface you would think, oh well if you double the distance surely you only halve the light. But of course if you look at this diagram, you look at the four feet mark where you have the light illuminating one square, one sort of unit if you like, as you double the distance the light has to travel out to eight feet, that same square is now four times larger because the light has extended outwards over a larger area because of course area increases in a square rather than just doubling and so the correct exposure at four feet would be f5.6 and the correct exposure at eight feet would be f2.8 which is of course two stops which is a quarter the light. Now as I stressed earlier this is an this is an inescapable principle. You can't cheat this, there's no way around it. It may not be as accurate as this diagram in real world situations because the precise figures of this diagram are based on something coming from a point source, so something you know, even smaller than that in terms of a light source, almost a laser in terms of the amount of fall off. But the principle is exactly the same. It might be a bit fuzzy either way. If you started off with a big softbox or a diffused cloudy sky, the effect wouldn't be quite as precise, but the effect will still happen. There's no two ways of getting around it. So, remember, think back to, if you double the distance, you quarter the amount of light. The easiest way to envisage it, I always find, is to think of those squares and think as the, the rays of light, the beams of light come out from the point source, a square that's this size here, by the time it's gone out, will now have to be four squares, okay? Try and think of it like that, and hopefully you'll get your head around it pretty quickly. So why does inverse square law matter? And more importantly, how can we use it and work with it on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, working from that same template of double the distance, quarter the amount of light, here is what happens over a distance from a light source to the amount of light there is. So if we start with what is a correct, let us say, exposure at one meter, so a unit of one, we know that if we double the distance to two meters, we now have a quarter the amount of light. Now we've simply got a set of distances here, we've just gone up one meter at a time, rather than doubling every time, and look at how the numbers change. So from one to a quarter the amount of light, to a ninth, to a sixteenth, to a twentieth, to one twenty-fourth, one twenty-eighth, and one thirty-tooth if that's the correct way of saying one thirty tooth. In practice, what that means is that, of course, the difference between one metre and two metre is really significant. So if you are lighting a large scene and you have something you want that is you know, very, very close to the light and then something that is double the distance behind that, the difference between those two things in terms of exposure is going to be very significant. There's going to be two stops different between something at one metre and two metre from your light source. By comparison, if you look further down the scale, something between, say, 7 metres and 8 metres, so two objects, one at 7, one at 8, the difference between those is going to be almost unnoticeable, because obviously the difference between 1 28th of the correct amount of light and 1 32th of the correct amount of light is pretty subtle. That's going to be very hard to detect. So in practice, you can apply this law when you're, well, shooting anything, but it's particularly useful for things like large group shots. It's particularly useful if you're in a small area, say indoors, and you're trying to create separation between your subject and your background. But, as we keep stressing, you can't escape it. And remember that the effect is much more noticeable with smaller distances, and the further away you get, the more diminished the effect becomes. Okay, hope that was uh, useful. 
Next video I've got coming up is more detail about inverse square law because it's such a vital principle. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, it's YouTube, so you know how it works. So subscribe, hit like, stick any comments and questions you've got below and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, meanwhile, I'll see you soon.